hello everybody and welcome to this new video. Uh, let's, let's, let's just just jump to the most important question that you guys have, which is uh, what happened to the other glasses? Well, I think I lost them. Let's go into the topic of today's video, which is Skinner boxes in video games or uh, how to make money in games, right? First of all, let's talk about the operant conditioning chamber. Following the work on behavior conditioning initiated by Pavlov and Thorndike, Researcher B.F. Skinner hypothesized, built and tested what is officially known as the operant conditioning chamber. Such device, colloquially known as the Skinner box, which you may remember from many, 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 many video games, is devised to achieve behavioral conditioning through a series of reactive responses to naturally occurring behaviors, often driven by curiosity. Behavioral conditioning, well, let's define that, right? What's behavioral conditioning? Uh, net, uh, behavioral conditioning is uh, naturally occurring behaviors, right? That are usually spontaneous forms of curiosity. They can be driven by fulfilling a need determined by survival instincts. But in case of more elevated creatures, such as humans, it can be guided by the promise of a dopamine rush. These behaviors or actions will then trigger a number of responses inside of uh, the Skinner box. Such reactive responses take the form of rewards, as prices, for example, and punishments, such as not prices. After a test subjects naturally perform that desired action or show signs of a desired behavior, a reward is issued uh, to test the subject, to the, to the test subject. To the, to the, on the contrary, if an undesirable behavior arises, a punishment is issued to slowly but surely alter the behavior of the subject into becoming conformant with the desired one. The game that will be used as a reference example is uh, Brawl Stars, a multiplayer competitive game that displays all the hallmarks of a Skinner box and as such is perfect for this analysis. According to Sensor Tower, the app generated uh, just in this month like $18 million on Android and iOS respectively, you can find the links below. Uh, it may be different uh, depending on when this month is. Uh, these earnings will be shown to generate from behavior modeling performed by the game and will be explored in the following minutes. Let's open up with something really easy to get, right? Operant conditioning, or uh, how to change the behavior of a subject by use of positive reinforcement. To quote Wikipedia, an operant conditioning chamber permits experimenters to study behavior conditioning by teaching a subject animal to perform certain actions, like pressing a lever, in response to specific stimuli, such as light or sound signal. When the subject correctly performs the behavior, the chamber mechanism delivers food or other rewards. In some cases, the mechanism delivers a punishment for incorrect or missing responses. Such conditioning can take various forms and can be performed using different reinforcement types, uh, which in the following minutes we will explore what those are and how they can be used in the context of video games and gamification to induce desirable behaviors and thus generate money from such behavior. First of this reinforcement types that we're gonna have a look at is called the fixed ratio reinforcement. A prize is awarded after a progression system has completed its cycle. This allows for two states inside the player's brain. One, frenzy. Two, exploration. The frenzy state grows according to the inverse equal square law, which is the same that regulates gravity and, and planets meshing together, and can be calculated by how close a player is completing the progression cycle. The closer they are, of course, the more the frenzy is frenzy. Knowing that there is a prize awaiting just a few points away, the player will more likely play just another game to grind the progression cycle and restart it, getting a burst of dopamine in the process. If the points needed to complete the cycle can also be taken away in the event, for example, of an undesirable behavior, uh, for example, you lost a game, the player can be kept in the state for longer. See, edging on that, <laughs> on that dopamine burst. It is advisable, though, to take away significantly less points from a loss that they can be achieved from a victory. Part 2. Exploration. The exploration state begins when a progression cycle is completed and there is no impending need to grind. In this state, the player is not thinking about the progression cycle as it is far away from completion. As such, the player is able to explore the other type of addicting exploits unknowingly, of course, but uh, this will be discussed further uh, later on. 
During the exploration, the player is more likely to pursue other micro-progressions or just to explore the game at their own leisure. Let's now see what this looks like in an example, in a practical example. In the, the game Brawl Stars, there exists a macro-progression cycle that the player is always filling up with a currency called trophies. Tr tr trophies? Trophies. They're called trophies. They can be won and taken away during regular matches, and the player is able to unlock rewards through this process. Trophies are extremely easy to grind in the beginning and exponentially harder to after a player has sunk in enough time cost into the game. As a secondary currency, we find tokens, a currency that can be won by completing quests and leveling up characters. This introduces two new progression cycles. The macro progression of the season, uh, a minified version of the trophies fueled progression we talked about before, in which an exponential number of points is needed in the same pattern as before by its resets every few weeks, uh, giving the player the same dopamine hit as they experienced during the beginning of the game when the trophies were the main goal, and also the micro progression of each character. By winning games with a character, the player can unlock tokens. If the character levels up, following the same curve described for the other progression cycles. In this way, the player is constantly kept in the following states. Trophies related frenzy that uh, during downtime is filled with tokens related frenzy that during downtime is filled with character related frenzy that during time time is filled with the exploration of the game. In Brawl Stars specifically, the exploration state is very rare as there is always a progression cycle to complete at hand for the player to Right. Nonetheless, uh, this is not the end of our own exploration of these exploitative systems, so let's have a look at something else. Variable Ratio Reinforcement Part 1. A prize is awarded to the player, keeping them in a state of subtle gambling addiction. Before we can talk about this uh, type of behavioral conditioning, though, we have to take a brief detour in the definition of what we have so far unspecifically called the prize. In games of this nature, there will always be a number of elements that the player will want to acquire. These elements can differ in visual, sound, and practical use, but will eventually always find themselves in one of these following categories. Currency or item. Currency is not necessarily something that is used in shops to acquire items, but it can also be the fuel of the progression cycle. Uh, this will be better explained in the example uh, afterwards. In any case, Currency is the most basic form of reward a player can gather after a game. As a small reward, it is predictable and often inconsequential in the grand scheme of things. It is though necessary to acquire currency to fuel the progression cycle and to purchase items in the shop, but the player will only think about it if they are in the frenzy state. Items are the reason players come back to the game. They are representative of the sunken cost and act as an inherently worthless but artificially awarded value in the game. It may be that an item comes in the form of a skin of a character, a weapon, or emotes in a multiplayer game, granting it inherent social value, and thus generated value within the game itself. Or it may be that the item is the character, a weapon, or an element of the game that is unattainable by means of direct purchase, granting such items an inherent value to the high demand but very low availability. Following the example on the real world diamond, an item can have a value inside a game world that is perceived as high and therefore is also perceived as worth pursuing. Now that we settled that, let's go into variable ratio reinforcement part two. Having defined what can be granted as a reward by completing a progression cycle, we can now better understand how this kind of behavioral conditioning works. So let's get into the mystery box. At the end of each cycle, a player uh, will always be awarded a prize. But the prize is never going to be naked, so to speak. The, player, uh, the prize will always be contained in a mystery box, a gambling-inducing container that the player will have to voluntarily open and that will contain various different types of prizes in different amounts. Knowing that inside these boxes we can find prizes of different nature, we can now understand that if an item is unobtainable by direct purchase, and is found randomly in these boxes, we can then grant the player that feeling that any box could be the one. It goes without saying that this kind of reinforcement layered on top of the previous one creates a strong infrastructure of entangling systems for the player that is very hard to get out of. 
It is also worth noting that the voluntary nature of the opening action creates anticipation in the mind of the player. This can lead to the possibility of hoarding a lot of mystery boxes for the purpose of having an extended dopamine rush, or by opening them immediately to achieve a similar rush by reaching a sense of pride and accomplishment <laughs> for having completed a progression cycle. Let's have a side note on gambling here, shall we? This reward system lightly threads uh, the line of gambling, as you may imagine. According to the law, this may not be considered gambling as there is no monetary value attached to the items found, although it does bear all the hallmarks of a gambling process and can indeed induce addiction. Let's have a look at another example. In Brawl Stars, after a progression cycle related to the release of a prize uh, to the player is completed, a reward will be issued in the form of a box of one of three sizes, ranging from small to mega, and it will contain a number of predetermined items. Such items are most commonly of the following types. Coins, used to purchase upgrades for the characters and low-value items from the shop. Gems, used to purchase higher-value items and mystery boxes from the shop. Experience points, used to level up characters. This level up must be bought with coins, so it's a self-feeding cycle, as you can see. Sometimes, though, using variable ratio reinforcement guidelines, these boxes can contain the following items as well. Abilities, special items that grant a character a unique ability that increases their inherent value inside a match. Generally speaking, if the same characters are fighting one versus one and are at the exact power level, the character that possesses an ability will always win. Or... Characters. These are unusually unobtainable without spending real money, or sometimes they just are unobtainable at all in any other way than finding them inside these mystery boxes. As we can see, this kind of behavioral conditioning keeps the player wanting to play and grind more so that they have the chance to gamble again and get the lucky prize, the high value item inside the random mystery box. Fixed interval reinforcement. This kind of behavioral conditioning is not necessarily tied to a price, but to a time interval that contains the opportunity for winning prices. What does it mean? This type of conditioning can be achieved in two different ways. One shot, by offering a small value prize whenever a desired behavior is showed at least once, or timed, by tying the possibility of losing rewards by not showing the desired behavior in a timely manner. So, in uh, one-shot cases, the player is rewarded directly through the use of an item that they don't have to work for. This will become clearer uh, in the example. By using this technique, a game can condition the player to play at least once a day, to perform the desired behavior and thus giving the game a chance to present stimuli that then will tie the player into the other condition strategies. In the time case, uh, by tying the possibility of winning rewards only to a specific time frame, the player is incentivized to return to the game as often as possible within the time frame. Do not lose that possibility. Again, the following example will clear up any doubt about such uh, behavioral conditioning techniques. Getting back to Brawl Stars, and the, the one-shot example for that would be that the reward is available to the player each time they log into the game for the first time each new day. This reward is often a low-value naked reward, such as coins, gems, or experience points, but can sometimes be a small mystery box, in accordance to the previously explained variable ratio reinforcement. The timed example would include seasons. Each season in the game is limited. After a few weeks, the progression cycle resets, and the player is unable to obtain the rewards contained in the expired season. The game also offers the possibility to see what they achieved in the previous season, creating the sense of having missed out opportunities to win prizes by not having shown or adhered to the desired behavior. Another example of this conditioning strategy comes into the forms of special events that can only occur once a week and last for a single day, creating anticipation and willingness to open the game on that specific date for the explicit purpose of playing such events. Both these techniques make sure that the game is open at least once a day, giving way to the other conditioning traps to have a go at the player, so to speak. Now, finally, let's talk about monetary exploitation, or how to make sure money is generated in operant conditioning chambers. First, progression cycles and rewards. This may be the simplest part of the equation, 
By designing interconnected and forward-feeding progression cycles that are not self-sustainable by themselves, we force the players to make a choice. The cycles must be designed so that they can grant rewards only by investing enormous amounts of time into the game. Additionally, a player is forced into this choice by keeping the rewards small enough that they're always nudged towards needing currency to progress and wanting rewards to get a dopamine hit. Vulnerability. The card is always on the string. So, progression cycles need then to be designed such that rewards flood the player in the beginning, then elongate the time between rewards significantly the more the game is played. The subtle but extremely effective strategies influence the decision of the player when approaching the game in general. They are subconsciously pushed in the direction of being in reach of the object of their desire, as defined by the game itself, of course, but they're always short of reaching it. At this point, they become most vulnerable and prone to making impulsive, instinctively driven decisions about the best way to achieve their goal, of course, to be satisfied and to feel that dopamine rush. As architects of such systems, we are given two avenues to capitalize on this vulnerability. So the first of all, uh, the first, the most obvious one would be in-app purchases. To obtain the same dopamine high, the player can decide to purchase currency or items with the real money, shortcutting the progression cycles or skipping it altogether. The alternative, of course, is to keep playing the game more and more entangled in the behavioral condition cycle that is then perpetrated continuously until some money is eventually spent. A more ethically viable strategy is uh, by the use of uh, advertisements. So as an alternative to spending money into the game, a well-orchestrated operator conditioning chamber has the ability to keep the players inside the game every day, multiple times a day, for sometimes long periods. This allows for the introduction of advertisements, either as a mean to acquire currency, should the player be required to watch it to keep playing, or just as an occurrence that the player will have to endure to continue with the game, regardless of any potential advantage they may get from watching it. In this case, it has been noticed that offering advertisements as an optional way to acquire currency or to get lower value items in the game has proven to be very successful. So, concluding, can we reconcile the ethics of operant conditioning? Well, the Skinner Box is the de facto solution to produce sustainable businesses built around the exploitation of behavioral conditioning. This is just a fact. And even if the ethical implications are so great to be impossible to ignore, it is not absolutely irreconcilable that a high-quality game that also sustains itself through the use of such devices and conditioning can indeed be created. Thus said, it will be inherently exploitative and as such ethically questionable. Notable further analysis, uh, not all boxes are made equal. Although we have only taken into consideration a multiplayer game, it's worth pointing out that results can be achieved in single-player games as well. If one were to speculate, the takeaway could be that if the box inside which, which uh, the game is contained, if well built, allows for any game to be contained inside it and still be somewhat profitable. Uh, I will just uh, give you a list of examples down below in the description of the video. Notable examples are as follows. New Star Soccer, a single-player game about managing a football star. New Star Manager from the same developer, single-player game about managing a team. I don't know, very imaginative. But that's why... Yeah. Duolingo, which is not actually a game, but is a gamified tool to learn new languages. Now, I know this was a very different video than my usual shtick, but then again, I don't have a usual shtick, and this is why usually my channel doesn't go anywhere and YouTube doesn't like me. But uh, here we go. This is a very um, nice and cool analysis that I wanted to do on operant conditioning chambers. Um, and it is very important to know these things if you're going to be a game developer and plan to make any money out of your games if they don't sustain themselves on a premium model, but they're going for a premium model. This stuff works for mobile games, but it has to be proven to work in console games. Look at, you know... Call of Duty, <laughs> look at the uh, fucking Star Wars Battlefront 2, uh, the 
you know, the new one, not the old one. Um, and actually, it was the first one. But whatever, you get what I mean, right? And uh, I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope it was very useful to you. I will link the article that I wrote, you know, my script, so to speak, uh, in the video description below. And I hope you guys uh, enjoyed it. And, uh, well, that's it. Bye-bye.